Hi, good morning everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, I guess we'll get started. Uh, we're going to do a little intro to deep learning talk uh, workshop. Uh, we're going to use Theano and a package called OpenDeep built on top of it. My name is Mark Speisinger. I'm the founder of Vitruvian Science as well as lead contributor to OpenDeep. That's uh, we're using it. A little outline of what we're going to go. Uh, we're going to first figure out what is actually deep learning uh, compared to normal machine learning techniques. We're going to do a little linear algebra refresher because all of deep learning is just matrix multiplications. Then we're going to do object classification using the MNIST handwritten digits data set. We're going to do two models on top of it. We're going to do first a normal feed forward net, also known as a multi-layer perceptron. And then we're going to do a simple convolutional net known as Linet. So what is deep learning? Uh, first, it's very loosely based on the brain. Uh, it's just a way to hierarchically represent your input features. So by hierarchically representing features, you get an exponential increase in the amount of inputs you can represent based on the number of layers you're adding one at a time. Uh, as you can see in the top right image, you have your input features uh, that connect to some hidden layer that can connect to multiple other layers before getting your output. And what this does is it learns useful representations given enough data. And a useful representation is something that can explain away the variance in your input data uh, by increasingly complex features. An example of this is with images, if you think of a normal face, you can have lower level features learned that are your edge detectors, your curves, and these uh, lower level features can piece together to form like the nose or eyes, and these other features can then piece together in higher levels to form a representation of a face. Now why is this really useful? This is useful because it automates feature engineering. As data scientists, I'm sure you know how difficult it is to pick out the handcrafted uh, features in a lot of your input domains. Um, and deep learning is a really big benefit is having that automated for you. You just throw all the data you have at it. And how does this work? Well, it's a composition of nonlinear transformations. And that gives you the increasingly powerful representations the more layers you have. And we'll go over kind of what that means in the linear algebra regression. So here's an example of that hierarchical representation, as I said before. Uh, as you can see, this is a simple model that's uh, three layers here uh, on the left. And the first lower levels are in those edges, and you can see them kind of pieced together to form the higher level abstractions of what the input should actually look like. Similarly with the audio signals, uh, you can imagine the sound bits coming in audio-wise as being lower level, and it can learn actually higher level representations of utterances, and full-on words over time. Now let's do a simple linear algebra refresher in case you have forgotten from school. Um, for a simple linear regression, you have a, a line that's fitted to some data points. So you're trying to find the line uh, that maximizes, uh, well, minimizes the distance between all the data points uh, as you're fitting in this simple 2D case we're going to do here. And the equation for the line is going to be uh, mx plus b, where m is your slope. Uh, your input feature is going to be x, and your bias is going to be b. Now, if you have multi-dimensional space instead of just a single input x, uh, you can have the slope represented as a weighted combination of your inputs. So in this case, uh, the output point y hat becomes the first weight component times the first feature input x, x1. The second weight component, w2, multiplied by the second feature input, x2, and so on for as many dimensions in your input feature space as you have. And then, of course, there's going to be a bias term at the end. Now, this can be rewritten as a matrix multiplication. Uh, so instead of writing it out w1, x1, you can just make matrices where you have all your weights in one vector, you have all your input features in another vector, uh, and you multiply them together um, to get your output point. So the output for linear regression is just going to be a matrix multiplication, uh, which is just a linear transformation of your input feature space. Uh, you multiply your weights matrix, matrix by your input features and add on the bias. Now for logistic regression, uh, this is going to be an example of a nonlinear uh, transformation. 
So we're going to do the exact same thing as we did before, where we multiply those weights that we're trying to find times the input features, w and x, uh, but we're going to squash it with a nonlinear function. In this case, it's going to be the logistic function, which ensures values between 0 and 1. So this can be rewritten um, simply by adding that nonlinear function on the outside of that linear transformation we did before, the wx plus b. And in this case, the nonlinear function uh, is going to be the sigmoid logistic function, which is 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x. In our case, x is the output from our linear transformation. What this does is it squashes the output from our uh, linear regression into the values between 0 and 1 so that it can be represented as a probability. And logistic regression is the most basic kind of probability estimation. So if you have an input feature space and you kind of have a class, binary class 0 or 1, and you want to estimate uh, the probability of it being a certain class, you run it through this sigmoid logistic function and you can get a probability estimate of how confident you are you think your output is that given class. Okay. Um, and then, as you can see, because you get a nonlinear representation of the input, actually you can keep stacking uh, nonlinear functions on top of it. And what this does is it allows you to transform the input function in, uh, by increasingly complex values. If you just have a linear uh, wx plus b and you multiply that by another weight matrix w, you're not getting any increased representational power. For any linear transformation, you can always um, condense it down into a single weight matrix times your input features. You're not getting any increased value of the representation. By doing a logistic uh, function or any other nonlinear function like a hyperbolic tangent, uh, you're getting an increasingly powerful representation because you can't just simplify it down into a linear, a single transform to your input space. So the main uh, problem we're going to work on in this workshop is object classification. And we're going to be using the data set on the left, the MNIST handwritten digits. Uh, but the object classification problem is given an entire image, can you classify uh, what the label is for this image? In the case of handwritten digits, it's going to be, is this a 0 through 9? Uh, another famous academic uh, data set is called ImageNet, and ImageNet uh, has uh, different objects, it could be a dog, a cat, a lemon, uh, these types of things. But given the entire image, can you classify uh, a correct label for what's in that image? Now, our first neural network is going to be the multilayer perceptron. And this kind of is a generalization of logistic regression. So the simplest form is we're going to have one hidden layer and then one output layer. So our input layer is just the input feature space that we have. All the input features we're going to use for the MNIST uh, recognition problem is going to be the pixel value, 0 or 1, um, because it's a black and white image. It's going to be a 28 by 28 square image. Um, so we're going to have 784 input features, basically each pixel. And we're going to feed that all in as the input layer. The hidden layer is just going to be what I showed before. It's going to be a, a nonlinear transformation. Instead of logistic, we're going to be using a hyperbolic tangent for the hidden layer. And then the output layer is going to be that logistic uh, probability estimate to figure out what class does it think this input digit is. Is it going to be a 0, a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9? So we're going to have a 10 dimensional output vector, one for each class. And what this does is it actually generalizes logistic regressions. Um, and so you're actually performing multiple in parallel to compute the probabilities for each of those classes. So the output is this 10-dimensional feature vector where you have uh, each class being represented as one dimension. So here's an example of some of the images that we're going to be looking at. Those are the hand-drawn images. It's going to be one at a time instead of divided uh, vertically like that. And the architecture we're going to do, as kind of I said before, we're going to have the input be a vector, a 1 by 784 feature. Um, in our case, we're going to do something called mini batch training, so it's actually going to be multiple images at the same time being fed through this network, uh, just to speed up training. Uh, so it's actually going to be a matrix instead of just a 1 by 28 by 28 vector. 
The hidden layer, uh, we're going to use 500 hidden units. Generally, in neural networks, uh, there are a few things you can think about when you're constructing like the number of hidden layers, the number of units in each hidden layer. And uh, if you're just doing normal, uh, normal neural network architecture without any noise in it, you're going to want to use a lower number of hidden units than your input feature space. And that kind of does a forced dimensionality reduction, right? So you're trying to map your input features to some higher representation. In our case, we're just going to do a 500 dimensional <coughs> hidden vector instead of the 784 input feature vector. And that forces some dimensionality reduction. When you add things like noise, you can actually make that unit larger. That's a hyperparameter you set, so you can hey, have a thousand hidden units, um, and noise kind of regularizes it for you. Um, but when we're constructing this hidden layer, it's going to be exactly the same format as I showed before for the uh, logistic regression, but in our case, we're going to be using hyperbolic tangent. So we're just going to have the hidden layer is equal to sigma times uh, x times the weight matrix Wx plus the bias uh, for the hidden layers, BH. And the weights are going to just be initialized as this 28 by 28 um, and 500 uh, matrix. Uh, so we're transforming that 784 into the 500 uh, dimensional space. So when you do the matrix multiplication, right, you need to have those numbers line up. Um, and then our bias is just going to be a 1 by 500 bias vector. Our output layer is going to be exactly the same as the logistic regression we did before, um, where we're doing, well, we're, we're doing a generalized version, so it's softmax instead of a sigmoid. Um, the softmax forces that across multiple features. So we're going to do the softmax of the hidden layer output times a weights matrix plus a bias. So all this is is a matrix multiplication, you add on a bias, and then you squash it with a nonlinear function. And the weights matrices are of the shape. Um, 784 by 500, and then 500 by 10, because we have 10 outputs we're trying to classify. And so, for the MLP, I'm going to show you uh, a few coding examples for it. The first is going to be in straight Theano code. Um, so Theano is a very useful Python package for uh, symbolic math operations. So you can write uh, equations in code as you would write them in a paper, and it compiles and optimizes the functions for you, and it has something called auto-differentiation. So you don't actually have to know how to calculate gradients by hand when you're trying to train this model. Um, it compiles and computes the gradients for you uh, during training. So the first we're going to go through is actually writing the neural network in Theano. Then we're going to show how to write it using OpenDeep, which is a package that I wrote on top of Theano. exactly as I showed in the architecture slide, it's fairly easy, but first let's kind of look at the data because that's the first thing you do whenever you start a machine learning problem. So we're going to um, look through this MNIST data set. If you haven't downloaded it beforehand, um, oops, there's the link to download a pickled version, um, a G pickled version, and what this actually is is um, it's actually been processed to be those 784 uh, vectors for each image instead of the 28 by 28 two-dimensional matrix per image as is uh, normal for this data set. So this is already going to be split into training and test sets as well as be into the vector form where it squashes everything into one dimension instead of two. So the way it's set up is it has um, these two poles, train X, train Y for the labels, valid X, valid Y, same thing for test set. Um, and that's all in this pickle file, so we're just going to use it, open it, and then load it via pickle. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the shapes. Uh, so we're going to see how many examples we have for training, valid, and test. And then we're going to look at what one example input and one example label looks like um, 
just to see kind of what we're working with. Oh, and a, another good thing about the app is that it can use your GPU or your CPU for free. So you just set it in the config file that you want to use your GPU, and if you have a nice machine rather than just a MacBook, like if you have a nice uh, GeForce Titan X, uh, it'll be a lot faster running all these examples. So it's a little bit slow just because this is on the MacBook, but um, the app is really good because you can use your GPU. So our input, uh, as I showed printing before, our shapes for our training set, we're going to have 50,000 examples. Um, that is the 784. In, uh, dimension image each time, and then we're going to have 50,000 um, vector uh, class labels for the labels. Uh, for the valid and test sets, we're going to have 10,000 uh, images and labels in each of those. And an example image uh, is here. Here's the 784 dimensional vector. As you can see, all the values are between 0 and 1. And yeah, it's this a large vector. And an example output label is. Five. So this image here corresponds to five. Um, great. So that was actually, yeah. And then here's an example code for just uh, saving an image, uh, or actually 25 of those images as examples, but you saw on the slide what those hand withdrawn digits look like. Great, so for Theano, because we write things symbolically, um, it has notions of variables. So you're going to have to write things in symbolic variables to start out with, and then you compile a function using those variables later on. So in our case, uh, the input to our model is just going to be a matrix. Uh, we're going to have, because we're doing mini-batch training, we're going to have multiple images fed into the model at a time. So that's going to be the first dimension, uh, the multiple images. The second dimension is going to be the 784 uh, feature vector for each image. So to construct uh, this symbolic variable, we just do uh, theano.tensor.matrix. In our case, we're importing theano.tensor uh, as t. And you can do you know, 3D tensors, 4D tensors, and dimensional tensors using uh, theano vectors, scalars. Everything can be represented symbolically. Now for our first transformation, where we're getting our hidden layer, all we needed to do was multiply a weights matrix by that input, add on the bias, and then squash it with our, in our case, a hyperbolic tangent function, but any nonlinear function. So first, we actually have to allocate you know, what the weights matrix is going to be. And this is something that we're going to be learning. Um, and this is the, the learned parameter, if you will, for the model. So first, we're going to actually randomly initialize it. Just because if you start at a non-random starting point, the model can get stuck uh, trying to train. You'll reach a local um, minimum, or you'll, you'll get stuck in other saddle points kind of in the optimization problem. So randomly initializing it um, is kind of the way to go. And in literature, there are a few ways to randomly initialize it. You can do uniform distribution or a Gaussian, um, depending on kind of what the model's doing. In our case, you don't really have to worry about that. So. We're going to initialize our wx uh, for the input transformation to our hidden space as a 20 by 28, which is 784 by 500 uh, matrix. And same thing for the bias. We're just going to initialize it to be zeros. In our case, we don't have to randomly initialize the bias. Um, that's also going to be learned. And it's just going to be a 500 uh, feature vector, or box vector. Now, these are real values because they're allocated by a numpy. Um, so to make them into the symbolic variables that the anode can work with, we just have to use this shared wrapper. So there are two ways to do the symbolic variables in the anode. First is to use the theano.tensor.matrix.scalar.vector. All these initializers, they allocate a uh, non-valued symbolic variable. Uh, we didn't provide any value of what the starting x's are going to look like. But in our case, for the weights, because we want to start them out as real values, uh, we can just wrap them as the shared variable um, from Theano. And that creates it into a symbolic wrapper so that we can use it in our equations. Uh, and you can give it names so it prints out nicely. So finally, we can, uh, now that we've initialized this, we can actually write the equation for what our hidden representation is going to look like. 
And in our case, it's just the dot product of the inputs x, the input matrix x, with our weights matrix wx, add the bias. Um, T again is the <coughs> dot tensor. And then we're going to do the dot tensor dot tan h, hyperbolic tangent, uh, around the result of that. And that's all it is for our symbolic hidden layer h. And you can use um, any other kind of nonlinear function. A side note is if we used softmax, that would be performing a logistic regression because uh, it's squashing it between 0 and 1 as kind of acting as probabilities. There's nothing that says you can't use that as a hidden layer as well. Um, 10H is used a lot in literature. Another thing called a rectified linear unit, RLU, is used, which is a maximum of 0 or the value output. So that's our hidden layer. And now we'll basically just repeat this process to construct our output layer. So our output layer, we're going to have to do the weights again and the bias again. Uh, in our case, it's going to be now a matrix for weights of size 500 by 10, because our hidden layer was um, 784 by 500, because we're having 500 hidden units. So we'll have 500 to a 10 unit output, because we have one output for each class label, a 0 through 9. So we'll do the same random initialization uh, for the weights, and then the same zeros initialization for the bias, uh, with just the shape 10. And we have to construct them to shared variables again because they have to be used in the computation graph. Now our final output y, or y hat, is going to be um, the softmax of the dot product, again, just the hidden layer dot product with our weights matrix plus the bias, and then we're just going to swash it with the softmax function, which is the, basically a multiple uh, logistic regression. So that's taking our hidden representation that's already an abstraction on top of our input features, and then it's performing the multiple logistic regression on top of that. And now we're getting probabilities. So because this is a 10-dimensional probability output, to get the actual label, uh, we want to get the argmax. So argmax takes the highest value and gives you the index of it, right? So in our case, actually, I think I have a slide. Yeah, in our case, in the bottom of this slide here, if we have a three-dimensional output, if we take the argmax of this, we're going to get two because the index two has the highest value. <coughs> yeah, I'll go back to the optimization. So that's everything for the model. As you can see, it's just uh, matrix multiplication, squash it with the nonlinear function, and then we have the second matrix multiplication of that output, squash it with another nonlinear function, and that's going to be our output probabilities. So, when training neural networks, what's used uh, most commonly is stochastic gradient descent, which allows for online training. So, you feed it in examples, it calculates how to wiggle those weights matrices, what direction to go in. Um, and it kind of moves those weights a little bit. Then you feed it in more examples, it moves the weights a little bit more, and you kind of do this walk, given all the examples you have, to go and try to minimize your loss function. In our case, we're going to do uh, negative mean log likelihood, uh, which is just uh, a fancy term for saying uh, you take the log of what the probability output was uh, for the correct label of what you thought was correct, and you try to minimize the, the negative mean of that. So in our case, um, trying to minimize negative log likelihood is pretty simple because our output is already all the probabilities. Um, so to find what we thought the probability of the correct label output was is we actually uh, use the correct label, say it was five, like our first image. Um, we use that to index into our probabilities, and then it'll just give you the probability we thought was five. So the probability we thought was five was, say, maybe 0.5. Um, and then we just take the log of that number and the negative mean. Um, except this is going to be done across all images, uh, so it's going to be done in mini batch training because uh, it's going to be a matrix instead of just the vector. So you're just going to have this, at the end of this, you're going to have one number that represents kind of our, uh, what we thought was the correct number. It's going to be the cost, um, the cost of how far off we were. If we thought it was a low probability, it's going to be a high number. If we thought it was a high probability, it's going to be a lower number. So we want to lower this number over time because that means we're getting more confident in what the correct answer actually was. And again, with stochastic gradient descent, uh, what you're doing is this online function that kind of takes data one at a time. 
and changes the parameters as you're going with data examples and tries to minimize uh, the cost function, in our case, that negative log likelihood. And you're doing this walk kind of or along the, uh, the, you can think of it as the optimization kind of uh, surface area. Um, so it takes the gradient at each step. Um, so if, if you remember from, uh, I didn't do the linear algebra question on gradients, but a gradient is basically the direction uh, that the numbers have to move uh, to kind of nudge it in the direction for our uh, cost function minimization. So if we're taking the gradient, it'll show you need to either move it positively or negatively um, at each time step, and it's gonna be for each individual weight in our matrix. So it's gonna show kind of how to wiggle it a little bit, uh, the weights matrix, to go in the direction of lowering our cost function. And luckily our gradients are all calculated by the end without us having to hand write the derivative for you know, what each weight uh, should be. And I'll show the optimization code using the end. Great, so here's just us constructing our cost function, the negative log likelihood. Um, again, we're going to have to use a uh, vector representation of what the correct label is uh, in our equation representation. So we're just going to do the tensor dot L vector, the integer vector, and we're going to call it labels. Now to get our uh, log likelihood, again, we're just going to index uh, what the correct label was, because our data set gives you a 0 through 9 number. We're going to index that into our alpha probability. Um, so here we're just taking the uh, log of our uh, log of the output uh, y in our case is the output of our uh, probabilities, uh, and then we're going to index into it um, what the correct label actually was. Yeah, it acts as a mask, and then we just take the negative mean of that uh, log likelihood, and that's our cost function. Now for stochastic gradient descent, calculating our gradients um, and parameter updates is pretty easy using Theano. We're just going to make a list of our parameters. In our case, it's our two weights matrices, Wx and Wh, and our two bias vectors, Vh and Vy. And to get our gradients, it's the easiest calling Theano.tensor.grad of our cost function with respect to our parameters. And now we have a list of the gradients, which is the derivatives of d cost with respect to Wx, the derivative of the cost with respect to the bias in the same order as the input list we fed it. Now, we don't want to um, move our weights which, with each example too much, so we're gonna have something uh, known as the learning rate. And what we're gonna be doing here is showing kind of how to update each parameter, in our case, the weights matrices and, and vectors, um, with respect to that gradient we just calculated at each time step. Um, for, for the example of any batch that's given. So in our case, we're just going to uh, take the parameter, it's, uh, the updates is going to be the parameter, uh, it's a tuple of the parameter, and the new parameter update that's gonna happen. So in our case, we're constructing tuples uh, with the original parameter, and then what the update is gonna be, we're just going to do the parameter minus this learning rate, which is just a small step, times that gradient. So we're going to be first reducing the effect of the gradient, uh, and then just adjusting that parameter um, for each time based on the gradient. So it's just the parameter minus the learning rate times the gradient for the parameters and gradients. So that's what's just going to happen to each uh, parameter as we feed it examples. Now we can actually create our training function. So Theano, uh, because we wrote it in this symbolic manner, so we initialized it with those symbolic matrices and vectors, and we also did the shared wrappers around the numpy arrays we created, um, we create this function that actually compiles and optimizes that computation graph for you. Um, and you can give it these things, the updates that it should be performing, as well as get the outputs that you want to show, and then you can just call this the yeah, function at train, in our case, on some input it will perform the updates that you fed it, uh, in our case, adjusting the parameters, and then output you whatever output you want. In our case, it's cost. If you want to output other things like accuracy, you can create the equation for accuracy and 
you can have multiple outputs from the same function and stuff like this. Um, and for testing, uh, what we're going to do here is we're actually going to output that y hat r max that we calculated before and just take the inputs x again. In our case, we're not performing the train updates, so we don't want this function to alter our parameters. So this is all we need to do to compile that testing function. So once those two functions are compiled, we can actually do our training loop. Um, so we're going to be doing mini batch training again. These are just hyperparameters you can set. We're going to do 100 images at each time step, go through uh, each, well, 100 images at each uh, function call. And we're going to use epochs. Uh, so epochs is one epoch per each time you go through your entire data set. So we're just going to be looping through our data set over and over in batches of 100 images. And because the scatching gradient descent is this online algorithm that changes those parameters based on these updates we just did at each uh, go through, we're just going to slowly block and wiggle our parameters to lower this cost function over time. And we can cut it off either after our cost function hasn't changed by a certain amount each time, or we can just have a set number of times we want to go through our data set. So we're going to compute how many batches we can fit just by dividing the, the length of the number of samples by the batch size, which is this arbitrary number. And then we're just going to feed each of these batches into our training and testing functions. So um, to grab our batches from our train inputs, um, we're just going to take the train x, which was loaded before from the MNIST data set. We're just going to index in um, which, which batch from it we're going to do. So we're just going to do uh, for index in the range of the train batches, um, you know, the index times the batch size. Uh, and, and go in those chunks through our data set. Standard Python kind of iteration through a matrix. Same thing for the labels, and then we're just going to feed it into our train function, which will compute the updates and adjust our parameters, and then we're going to feed it into our uh, test function, which will actually output the predicted labels, 0 through 9, and then we're just going to print out some accuracy score. We're going to keep track of that, which is you know, uh, the sum of the predictions actually equaling the labels that were there. Uh, divided by the length. So it'll be an it's average accuracy over time. And we're going to do that for each batch. We're, then we're going to average the accuracy for, and costs, the accuracy and costs for each of those batches um, to calculate the epoch. And then we're just going to do the exact same thing for the validation and test sets, but instead of you know doing the F train function, uh, we're just going to do the test function because you don't want to train on your validation or uh, your testing data sets. Um, this is just going to give us a better view if the model is overfitting or if it's underfitting or how it's performing on quote unquote real world data. It's just this held out portion of your data set. So that's all for training. Uh, we can run this and get a little idea of how it's working. As you can see here, epoch 1 is being calculated. The cost function is pretty high, 0.99, it's going to go 0.51. So we can see it minimizing over time. Uh, our accuracy started, test accuracy started at 87%, now it's going up to 90.6%. Um, and it'll keep getting better to 92-ish percent, because it's a very simple model. A single hidden layer, and then a single output layer. And a good thing to look for here is that uh, the testing and validation accuracies uh, are kind of in the same range as our training accuracies. Uh, if they were significantly uh, lower accuracy than our training, that means we're overfitting. Uh, just because, you know, we're trying to memorize that input data and it's not generalizing well to our validation and test set that we're not training. But in our case, you know, 92.8% and 93% is very close, which means it's generalizing well to the held out test set. Two more epochs. And it, it can keep getting better the longer you run it. Um, you know, it kind of goes asymptotically. So that's the multi-layer perceptron, just also known as the feed-forward neural network. Uh, one hidden layer, one output layer in straight piano code. Now there are a bunch of libraries written on top of piano just to make it easier because you can see, based on this layer uh, by layer fashion, that we're doing this wage multiplication 
uh, this nonlinear function, you can easily abstract that away into these little modules um, for each of those types of layers. So uh, we're going to be using OpenDeep, but there's also Keras, Lasagna, Pylinr2, Blocks, all of these uh, packages on top of Theano make it easier to construct neural networks. So. Here's the same thing, um, but we're just going to create an OpenDeep. Um, a quick intro to OpenDeep is you have those same kind of four base components that you use when you're building any model. One's going to be your input variables. The second is going to be kind of your layers and your actual model construction. Uh, the third is going to be this loss or cost function. And then the fourth is going to be the optimization using stochastic gradient descent. Um, there are a bunch of variants on top of stochastic gradient descent. Uh, that either you know, rely less on the learning rate that you said initially, or they do some momentum updates with the parameters, uh, other ways to just make the optimization faster or um, better overall, easier to learn. Um, so in our case, uh, for OpenDeep, you are going to use these uh, layers. Uh, in our case, those uh, hidden transformation is just a normal dense layer, also known as fully connected layer just because it's a matrix multiplication. Um, then our output is going to be a softmax probability layer. Uh, that's also just a subclass of the dense fully connected layer that forces you to use the softmax output. And we're going to construct everything in this prototype model container. Now, a prototype is very similar to Torch's sequential, where you can add layers one at a time. And this lets you automatically hook up the input to the next layer as the output of the previous layer. Uh, it's just syntactic sugar. You could all obviously manually hook all the layers together. Um, another thing we're going to do is we're actually going to add dropout noise uh, between the hidden layer and the output layer. And as I said before, noise is, an, is a regularizer. So you can actually use more hidden units, uh, also known as overcomplete. So our input feature space is 784. We can use 1,000, 2,000 hidden units. And if we don't add any regularization, like noise, the, the uh, hidden layer will just memorize our inputs, and we're going to be overfitting to our training set. If you add noise, this randomly um, will either, in our case, we're going to drop out, so set to zero, uh, some of the outputs in our hidden layer, and that forces the network to not rely too much on a single output, um, and therefore kind of regularizes the weights so that you're not just using all of your uh, hidden outputs to memorize what the training input's looking like. So we're just going to use a simple noise wrapper that we have here that includes dropout. Um, again, when you're using those functions in Theano, remember you can specify lists of outputs to look at. So we're just going to use um, a, a simple way to create an arbitrary function to monitor during our training. So we're just going to use this monitor classes rate. Um, and then we're also going to take negative log likelihood from our loss, optimization loss, uh, as well as our optimization being the added delta version of stochastic gradient descent, which relies a lot less on your learning rate, so you actually don't have to set that. Um, then we're going to be using an MNIST wrapper for the data set. So all the, all the imports, it just has those four major components for any model, your input variable, your layer types, your, your actual model construction, uh, your cost function or your loss function, and then your optimization. Uh, but first, to actually see what's going on under the, under the hood, you can configure this root logger that shows all the debugging output. If you don't want any debugging output, uh, or any output actually at all, you just don't call that function. Uh, yeah, so here's the entirety of the model. Uh, instead of having to write those symbolic equations by hand, all you do is first define that prototype container that lets you add layers one at a time. You define your input variable and its shape. Uh, the shape is necessary for uh, automatically hooking up the inputs together, because the animal right now you can't actually take the shape of an arbitrary equation. Um, so we have to define that to start out with. So in our case, again, we're just using the theano.tensor.matrix uh, theano of x's. And if the shape is going to be none, because we don't know how many batch, what, uh, what the batch size is beforehand, uh, or you could write the batch size beforehand, um, if you're going to be using fixed size batches. Um, and then it's just going to be the 28 by 28 vector again. Now, to initialize the same layer that we did here for our hidden layer, uh, it initializes all the weights and does that calculation for you, is just this dense layer. So we're going to first add 
in the stance layer to our prototype container with the inputs being the tuple of the shape and the input variable. We're going to specify the output size to be 500, and we're going to specify the activation to be hyperbolic tangent. And as easy as that, we just kind of added our first hidden layer representation to our MOP. Now, again, for regularizing with noise, um, it's easy to just add that in over on top of the outputs for our hidden representation. So we just add the noise class. Um, so instead of having to specify the inputs because we're using this prototype container, all we have to do is specify the first argument being the class type we want to add, and then all the keyword arguments uh, for that class initialization afterwards, and that will automatically initialize the class with inputs equals the output shape of the previous layer and the outputs from the previous layer. So it's just an easier way to hook it up. So we're going to add the noise that's going to be dropout noise. You can also add uniform noise, Gaussian noise, salt and pepper noise, um, all these sort of random noises you can add in. And we're going to specify it to be uh, 0.5 noise level, which is the probability of setting some values to zero. And then finally, we're going to add our softmax classification layer, where it's just going to be a softmax with 10 outputs. And the out is probs uh, function just defines if our outputs is going to be either that argmax or if it's going to be that vector. In our case, we want the argmax, so it's going to be false for the output as probs. And so that's our model with noise edited. Uh, another note on noise, if you're going to write it in Theano, you have to use a, a fancy kind of if statement symbolically. It's called a switch function uh, because you don't want to add your noise during test time. So uh, with Theano, you can use theano.tensor.switch, and that's a symbolic if statement. So if um, some variable equals this is the training set, we add noise, and if not, it's just going to be the normal output. So now the same thing for optimization. We're going to define uh, using negative log likelihood as the cost. So we have to first define the variable that's going to represent our correct labels again. Um, just like we have to define the variable that represents our input matrix x. So we're just going to do the L vector for the y's, uh, which are just integers. Um, and then we're going to take the negative log likelihood of that. So in our case, the MLP actually keeps all the layers that you added in it in the property called models. So the models is just going to be a list of all the layers that you have in your prototype container. Um, so then minus one indexing is the last model that we had, in our case, the softmax. Uh, and softmax has the py given x also. You can do get outputs in our case because, actually no, you can't do get outputs because we set them to be the integers. So we're going to do dot py given x, and that's going to be the probability vector, uh, the 10 dimensional vector as we have here. Uh, the targets for negative log likelihood is the labels, um, labels variable we just did here. And one hot encoding is not going to be true. So one hot encoding is uh, given a label. It's kind of the reverse of argmax. So it's going to have a one in the index that the integer was and zeros everywhere else. So if it's five, uh, you're going to have this 10 dimensional vector where a one is going to be in the, in the fifth position and zeros everywhere else. That's one hot encoding. But in our case, our, our, feature, our labels are actually going to be the integers themselves. So it's not a five. Uh, then we're just going to monitor the accuracy. Um, again, so we just create this monitor wrapper that will allow us to view it during training in our optimization phase, where we're just going to name it accuracy. Um, monitors are used also because you can have things graph automatically over time. Uh, if you want that, you need to install Bokeh. Um, so it can actually graph these values over time for you when you start a Bokeh server locally on your machine, and it will show them in real time as it's training for any arbitrary expression from your model that you want to compute. Uh, you can also save it to files if you want to read it in from D3 later on, and stuff like that. Uh, in our case, our expression for accuracy is 1 minus the average cost of us being wrong. So in our case, it's just the not equals our outputs, uh, not equaling the labels, uh, 1 minus the mean of that. So that's the average accuracy percentage. Again, instead of having to load uh, MNIST or download it locally, there's just a simple wrapper for it because it's used so much in academia. So we'll just initialize our MNIST wrapper for the data set and uh, start our optimizer. So we're going to use Adic Delta, which again doesn't really depend too much on our learning rate. And we're going to feed it the model, which is our MLP container that we made. Our data set's going to be the MNIST. Uh, our loss function is there. And we're going to just run it for 10 epochs first, and we're going to have a batch size of 64. Um, these are just hyperparameters you can set. 
and then train it with our monitor uh, accuracy being tracked over time. And here's all the debugging output that you'll see. Um, but you can see things like the training and valid test shape for our inputs. And you can see kind of the arguments that you passed into each layer. So we're adding noise with the inputs being automatically hooked up, stuff like that. Um, the weights matrices, how they're being initialized, training weights W with 780450 uh, size from a uniform distribution. Um, we're using GLURA or Montreal initialization first. But Again, it's just the debugging output showing you kind of what's being done. Uh, and as you can see here, it's just training. Um, we're turning on the switch for training, and we're going to be turning off the noise switch for testing and valid. Um, and the accuracy is here, so 87%, 92%, and it's getting better up to 97%. Um, and that's just for the 10 box we've trained it for. Of course, just letting it run longer, you get higher accuracies. So that's kind of a very in-depth look on how the simplest neural network works in writing a straight piano code and then using some sort of wrapper library on top, where you can just easily add those layers in a modular fashion, connecting the inputs uh, to be the outputs of previous layers. Uh, and yeah, regularization is that noise dropout that we added. So, What's actually more appropriate for this object class classification uh, task is something called a convolutional neural net. And this is different from your normal feedforward dense uh, layers that we were adding before, in that you're performing a convolution operation over your input. So what we're actually going to do here is we're going to take the image as it was in the two-dimensional matrix, 28 by 28, for an image, um, and convolve a kernel on top of it. And so what a convolution does is it just uh, as you can see on the right hand side, as on the right hand side, all it's doing is taking this matrix that you have, the kernel, so in this case it's 2, 3, 0, 0, 1, 3, uh, multiplying it by a patch on your input. Uh, in our case, it's going to be pixel 2, and it takes its surrounding context. So you're just multiplying and adding those numbers together, uh, and that's a convolution, and it operates in a sliding window fashion. So it goes over the entire image, uh, it'll calculate for each pixel uh, what that the surrounding kernel times the surrounding pixels uh, and add them together to create what the output should be. And this is very useful, especially in images, because it takes a local context window into account for constructing your feature. So we're going to be taking kind of the spatial representation of where the pixels are in relation to each other in the 2D space, and we're going to use that context to create some hidden uh, representation. So when you're convolving the outputs in a sliding fashion, um, we're essentially taking that context into account and we're going to get a much more rich feature representation rather than taking just that 1D784 vector as the input because you're getting the spatial representation in two dimensions rather than a uh, single dimension. And it also is more translation invariant. So if you have the number in like the upper right hand side of the image, uh, the convolution will output the same features as you would if it were in the lower left-hand side of the image. Whereas in our single vector case, each input feature is kind of fixed in its location, so you can't move around your object that much. Now, to create a neural network out of this kind of convolution operation, oh, and uh, the feature that's actually, uh, the parameter that's learned in a convolutional net is that kernel. So we're trying to learn kind of what are the weights for the surrounding pixels you're gonna use to calculate this hidden feature. Uh, for the convolutional neural net, it's normally done with the convolution operation paired with uh, something called pooling. And pooling is just a dimensionality reduction. So it's like given a 2 by 2 grid of those features, take the maximum value of that and perform this across your entire space, and that'll uh, reduce the size of your outputs by half, right, if you do a 2 by 2 max pooling. Um, and we just kind of layer these convolution pooling layers together, and then we'll need to transform it into this fully connected dense layers like the MOP we just did to get our final output classification using softmax. Um, convolutional neural nets uh, create these kernel representations that can learn these types of features. Kind of as I was showing before with the face example, 
uh, with the edges going to like noses and eyes and faces. Uh, you can see here for an object like a car, um, this is probably trained on ImageNet. Uh, you have your input edges that are kind of found. It learns textures uh, and then kind of patterns for objects themselves. And that's really what a convolution operation learns for you. It learns the texture of an image and it's able to extract out kind of these, uh, these textural and color components that are more likely uh, suited to classifying objects than you hand picking the features from an image yourself. Uh, 2012 is really kind of the breakthrough uh, that, that convolutional nets uh, take over the object classification space. Uh, ImageNet is a yearly competition that's kind of now used as the best of the best for image recognition. ImageNet has uh, a huge data set size of, uh, I think, a few thousand uh, class, classes that you have to classify. And as you can see here beforehand, people were hand engineering features using algorithms like SIFT, uh, these other classic computer vision algorithms, and you, they were getting, you know, 25, 30 uh, percent um, error. In 2012, when convolutional ads kind of first took off, uh, immediately drops to 15 percent, and now it's hovering at around 7 percent uh, error. And kind of, I think a baseline, if I remember correctly, a single person, Andre Karpathy, has actually done the ImageNet challenge himself. He does not recommend doing that. Um, <laughs> He, as a human baseline, is kind of quoted as getting uh, between 3 and 4% uh, error. <laughs> so, if you have a few hours, um, or you know, a few days, you can also do it yourself and get another baseline so we're not anecdotally taking human performance from a single person. <laughs> the risk is when you realize you're worse than this. Yeah. <laughs> you take it, you realize you get worse accuracy. It's interesting because he found that uh, the errors he took were very different from the errors that the algorithm would get. So he has difficulty with you know, fine-grained distinctions between things like dog breeds. Uh, he had to look those up on Google like, while he was doing the test, and that would take a lot longer. Whereas the algorithm, because it does this texture extraction, is really easy to tell minute differences between types of classes. But uh, for other things like just general classes, if there aren't enough input training examples, it would perform really poorly, where you'd be like, oh yes, that's a horse. Where the algorithm would be like, yeah, no idea. So it's very different types of errors, which is very interesting. So I'll show you, using OpenDeep, a simple way to construct this convolutional net architecture, where we have a convolutional layer, pooling layer, convolutional layer, pooling layer, and then feeding into our basically the MLP that we made before. Great. Okay, so Again, the same types of imports we did before. We're going to use that prototype container just so we can add layers easily, sequentially. Um, we're going to use a convolution, or 2D convolution layer uh, for the convolution function, and the dense and softmax as before, as we did for the MLP. Dense being just your normal matrix multiplication softmax, forcing that into a softmax uh, output probability. Then we're going to also add dropout noise uh, to regularize uh, the hidden features. And we're going to be using the pooling as we did before because we need to alternate convolution and pooling layers. And in our case, we're going to do max pooling in two dimensionals. So we're going to take the monitor as well because we want to you know, look at accuracy instead of just the cost function. And uh, we're going to do negative log likelihood just as we did before. Um, take MNIST as we did before and use that adult to the same things. The only thing that's different is we need to modify our data set in real time as we're feeding it into the example. So OpenDeep works with actually any iterable, as you, if you want, as a data set. So um, it kind of works in a streaming manner. It'll pull examples out to fill up batches. And because it's kind of this functional uh, streaming paradigm, you can do other functional uh, things on top of it, like compose functions on top of your data as you're pulling it out. So in our case, we're going to do a modify stream, which lets us define an arbitrary function that will be run on top of each example as we pull it out of the data set. And we need this because the MNIST wrapper that's, that's included here is that uh, 1D784 feature vector. And to feed into the convolution, we want it to recreate it into the two-dimensional space because uh, we want it in the original image. If we are using an MNIST data set that you can download, I think, from Yan Lekun's web page, you can get the 2D images themselves without having to modify it. But it's a good example of showing if you want to modify in real time your data, uh, here's how to do it. So same thing as before, 
we're going to initialize this prototype container to add layers to sequentially when we're creating a model. Now, the input to a convolutional net is actually a four-dimensional uh, tensor instead of just the 2D matrix, as we were doing before. And the kind of shape for our 4D input is going to look like this. We're going to do the batches as the first dimension, so a bunch of images. And then it's going to be channels. So in the case of images, it's normally three-channel, uh, three-dimensional, which is a three-channel um, input. So we're going to have one for RGB. In our case, because MNIST is just a black and white image, it's just going to be a, a single channel. Um, but this works on color images, uh, the convolutional operation. So you can just add three if using colors instead of just one in our case. And then we're going to have rows and columns. Uh, so this is commonly known as BC01 uh, for the kind of input shape. Uh, batch channel row call. So we're going to initialize this four-dimensional tensor, as well as the shaping none. We don't know the mini batch size really. Uh, single channel because it's black and white image, 28 by 28. Now to add this convolution layer, it's the same way we added our dense layer before. Where now we initialize this convolutional 2D, setting the inputs being the shape and the input variable we defined right here. Um, now the parameters that you provide to convolution are a little bit different than the parameters for the uh, just the dense, uh, which defines the output size uh, for that matrix multiplication. In our case, for our convolution, we're defining the number of kernels we want to do, uh, also known as the filters. You can think of it as filters filtering out textures from the image. So we'll just take 20, uh, 20 filters here. It's kind of arbitrary. It's a hyperparameter. And the filter size is just that kernel size. So basically, how much of the surrounding context you want to take in. In our case, we'll just do a 5 by 5 uh, grid for each of the filters. So we're going to be learning 25 by 5 filters of textures for the first layer on top of the input image itself. Um, border mode is actually a, um, a parameter to Theano's convolution 2D operation. In our case, full, that means you calculate the um, convolution for every pixel in the input image. And that'll, uh, because the kernel size is 5 by 5, right, at the edges, it'll overlap with the outside of the image. And if you want to compute the numbers for the kind of edges that can go outside, it'll zero pad your image. So it'll just make sure the size fills up so that you can compute it for every pixel so the output size, in our case here, will be the same as the, uh, well, it's not the same size as the input size, but it, it covers the entirety of the input. Uh, if you do valid, it will only, it won't zero pad it, it will only compute the outputs for the pixels that have the surrounding context size uh, with padding around them. And we're going to use RALU, also known as Rectified Linear Units, as the activation function, which is commonly used instead of hyperbolic tangent uh, for convolutional events. So that's our, just our first two-dimensional convolution layer. Uh, now we want to do that pooling, uh, as shown in the architecture. So we're just going to do two by two maximum pooling uh, on top of that convolutional output. And that's the same way you just add the class type and then any initialization variable. And then again, same thing we added with noise before, we'll add dropout noise. Um, and so now we have the convolution, pooling, and the noise to regularize it so it's not going to overfit to our potato. Because especially with the convolutional nets here, uh, we're going to be quite over complete as far as learning features, and it's going to be easy to memorize kind of that training input. So we don't want to memorize that. So we have the regularization noise. So that's our first kind of, it's called a comp pool layer, kind of in literature. They often group these two together and just call it one there. Um, we'll add a second one doing the same exact thing as before. We'll up the number of filters to 50, because why not? Uh, and then we'll do the zero padding again, pooling two by two, and add dropout noise. Same as before. So now we've basically just added six layers into our model, which would have taken a lot of the input to right? Now, because the convolutional output size is uh, still four dimensions, uh, to feed it into our dense uh, hidden representation and then our softmax output classification, we're going to actually have to flatten it back into two dimensions. So in our case, uh, what I tried to do with OpenDeep is to make it kind of work in conjunction with Theano instead of a replacement for it. So you can do Theano operations in between layers and uh, sort of modifications to layers as you want using Theano code if you need to modify things. Um, and I think this is you know, useful, especially for state-of-the-art development. If you need to implement a new model from a paper, you know, it's not going to be just straight using these predefined layers. You're going to have to do some sort of piano you know, operations in between, stuff like that. Um, so here's just an example of doing that. 
we're going to flatten the output, which is 4D, uh, from our final noise layer, from our comp pool layer. Uh, so that's easy, it's just the piano.flatten into two dimensions here. So again, the dot models is the entire list of layers we have in the prototype to date. So we're going to get the last layer, in our case it's going to be this noise output, get its outputs, and flatten it to two dimensions. And the shape we still have to calculate, um, I'm actually going to be working with the piano team to try to make this part of the piano so you don't have to do these shape calculations. Um, but it's just going to be the output size, the first dimension still is going to be the batch size, and then we're just going to multiply all the other shape dimensions that we have um, together, just because that's what the flattening does. It just squashes everything into one, um, one of the dimensions instead of spread out. So we multiply them together and then get the shape. So adding the same MLP as we did before, it's just dense noise and softmax. So dense, we're going to do the inputs because we did a modification here. So we're going to hook up our dense in shape and our dense input, which is the flattened. We're going to have 500 <coughs> output units with 10H instead of RALU. Uh, and we're going to add the dropout noise, same as before. And then finally softmax classification, the same as before. Optimization is identical to what we did with the MLP. We're taking the negative log likelihood because the output is the same. We still have that 10 dimensional probability vector output. So we're going to take the softmax's probability of y given x, uh, that probability vector output, take the target labels we created, same as before, integer, symbolic integer for the labels, and again, it's not one hot encoding. Our accuracy monitor, again, is the same thing. It's you know, the negative, one minus the negative mean, or one minus the mean of, is our output prediction not equal to our labels? And we're going to cover it on the valid test set. Now here's the processing of the MNIST part. Uh, again, because the MNIST wrapper we have here goes to that one by 784 uh, vector for each image, we need to reconstruct it into its 2D space, 28 by 28. So it's easy as just doing this modify stream for each image, so we're just going to create a simple lambda function. You can define any, any function you want uh, that can be complex. Uh, but in our case, it's just going to be a simple numpy reshape. So we're going to do a numpy reshape of the image into a 1, because we're going to have the, um, the number of channels be 1, uh, just, uh, just black and white, uh, 1 by 28 by 28. So that's an easy reshape of the 784 vector into a 1 by 28 by 28 3D matrix for each image. <coughs> And because this does on each image, as it's getting pulled into the batches, we don't have to worry about kind of any sort of batch calculation. So to kind of modify our inputs, we just take the train inputs, valid inputs, and test inputs for this data set, MNIST, and we just set it equal to the modify stream. So we just modify the train inputs with that function we defined. So now our batches will be of the size of the uh, number of batches by 1 by 28 by 28 uh, when we're feeding it through the network. And again, we're going to use Ada Delta just because it's easy and works pretty well, not reliant on learning rate as much. We'll take the Lynette model we just made, the MNIST data set that's been modified for its inputs, the loss function, negative log likelihood, we defined as before. Uh, we're just going to run it for 10 epochs because this takes a while and we're going to have a 64 batch size, and we're going to look at the accuracy. Now this is pretty slow on a MacBook, just because the graphics card isn't that good. If you use something um, like a GTX uh, 780 or above, like the 780, this runs in 20 seconds per epoch. On the MacBook, I think it's about two minutes. So uh, I'll keep doing the talk while this is running, and you can kind of look at the output of it later. As you can see here, the parameters that are going to be learned are all these convolution um, and weights matrices that are learned. So the first is the convolution kernels, and the bias, same again, kernels bias for the second convolution layer. And then we're going to have the weights matrix and bias for the dense layer, and then the same thing for the softmax. Uh, you can see here that uh, one, one drawback of piano is when you're compiling those functions, it can sometimes take a long time, especially if you're using something like a recurrent net, which has a lot of time, uh, a lot of computation over time steps, which if you unravel it over time is actually a very deep neural net. So if you have an input sequence of 50 units long, you can imagine it as being, if you have one layer for the hidden recurrent layer, you can imagine it being as a 50 layer neural network if you unroll that over time. So 
when the NLP kind of optimizes those things to run quickly for you, the compilation time takes a lot longer. In our case, it was only two seconds, but I've, I've seen it go up to like half an hour. So as we're running, kind of do the summary. Uh, so what is deep learning actually? It's a model that learns the hierarchical representation of the input, and that learned representation is uh, feature engineering done automatically for you. So you don't have to do this tedious hand tuning of what features work best for your output. And how is this doing it? It uses the compositions of nonlinear functions uh, that can learn the different levels of abstraction. So you get a more powerful representation the more layers you add, um, instead of using a linear transformation which will just compile down into a single linear function transformation of your input. So you're getting a more powerful function by stacking these nonlinear functions together. And this is learning a useful feature, so you don't have to hard code feature engineer. And one caveat is with, especially with larger networks, is you need lots and lots of data. Um, just because you know, you're learning like 784 times 500 parameters at each step. The parameter space is huge. Like in large convolutional nets like Google Net or BGG, you're learning millions of parameters. Um, and it takes a lot of memory in your GPU and it takes a lot of time to do. Um, which is why you know, distributed methods have been done. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard of the new TensorFlow library from Google. Uh, so that's also, you know, well, they don't have the distributed section out yet, but they're going to have distributed learning for free, which is very nice. I'm actually going to be porting over to, over to use TensorFlow as the back end. And so we first learned the MLP model, and this is generalizing the logistic regression, just a single hidden transformation, and we have our softmax probability output. And all it is is a matrix multiplication by some, either the input or intermittent layers, and then you just squash it. And you're going to be learning these weights that you're multiplying with, those are your features. So again, deep learning is forming this hierarchical representation using basic building blocks, uh, layers that you can connect in arbitrary fashions. Uh, it's just matrix multiplications over and over. And you can make really complex networks using the simple components. Um, an example, is using, a, say, the image using a convolutional net tied with text. Uh, if you want to learn captions for an image, uh, you can take the image, uh, learn its convolutional features, like we were doing with our convolutional net. Instead of take the probability output, just take the last convolutional layer's output, hook that up to a recurrent net, which is good for time series, and start generating uh, language output. And then you can learn kind of, you know, what the caption should have been for the image based on a data set of images and captions like Xcoco and stuff like this. Um, and it's all learned using the same optimization function, which is incredible. Um, just because you can calculate the gradients for each of these parameters uh, by simple uh, backpropagation using um, the chain rule for gradients, uh, you can actually learn all of the parameters for a very large complex network uh, at the same time. And I'll take some questions, but quickly we'll look over the outputs. Here. As you can see already, the accuracy uh, training actually is 92%, test accuracy is 98%, so it's already a lot better than the MLP was. Um, and it's not overfitting because the training accuracy is actually lower than our valid test accuracy, so that's a good thing. Um, and you can see here, it's for the uh, 10 epox, it estimates 16 minutes remaining. Uh, just because on this GPU, it takes two minutes per epoch. So. Uh, just, just because the, the model is much larger, convolutions take a lot longer to do, um, and this GPU is particularly good. And with that, I'll take questions. Um, you showed a couple of photos. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. You had a couple of slides where you're showing that in each layer, the neural network was looking for different things. Like the first one was like was like edges and, and something else, and then faces. Mm -hmm. um, is there any uh, are there any functions that do that for you? That so, show that yeah. visualization. Yeah. So at least for the first layer, that's very easy. That's just actually taking the weights that are learned and forming an image in from them. Um, and for the higher levels. It's kind of, well, for convolution nets, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated because you have to do a reverse convolution function. Um, 
but those visualizations are essentially just showing what those weights or kernels are actually looking like uh, on an input space. So you kind of condense it down to the input by doing reverse convolution from higher levels, or for the weights matrices, you just make an image from your weights. Like, you actually take the weights matrix as, as, a, as an image itself. Oh, so you're saying it's pretty easy to write your own code to do it? Mm -hmm. okay. So I was wondering, um, do we need to also be thinking about like the quality of the noise that we use to regularize, or does that not really matter? Uh, yeah, so the main thing to consider for the noise you're using is, is the noise type appropriate with the output or input uh, type of, of data you have, right? So dropout is most commonly used for convolutions and everything like that, but if you have other types of layers, like for 10H output, you can easily add Gaussian noise or for real values. Um, if you're using, say, a binary input, you can easily do like salt and pepper. Um, so it has to, like, instead of Gaussian, you right? So if you have binary input, you wouldn't want to use Gaussian noise because it's not the value. Um, that's the main thing you have to consider is the type of noise appropriate for what the output type is going to be. You have to know kind of the values, the range of values that you're going to be getting. As far as the amount of noise, um, I mean, that's, that's just like a parameter that's kind of uh, iffy in literature, it's like you start out with higher noise and kind of lower it if you're, um, you know, getting too much regularization or if you start out with lower noise, you know, you can increase it if you're still getting overfitting, uh, stuff like that. Uh, in general, it's like 30% to 50% is used. I mean, I normally just start with 50% noise and see if it's kind of working for first few epochs. If it's not, you stop it, change the noise, start for another few epochs. Um, some techniques like Bayesian hyperparameter learning is something you can use instead of having to set these hyperparameters. It kind of learns a statistical model of what they should be uh, over time. There's a package called Spearmint, um, released by Harvard, that does this Bayesian hyperparameter tuning. Um, I plan on adding it at some point in Dopamine, but uh, it's a, a lot of two right now. But I mean, for now, you can do your you know, grad student grid search where you <laughs> just try a bunch of models in, in the grid ranges. And that's what's done in academia, actually. So um, is there any generic rule for the number of layers you need to do for the features, or is there, um, I guess, a point of where you add so many layers you get to sort of a saturation point? On that yeah, there definitely is. Um, kind of the rule of thumb is to start with a simpler model, and if it's not working adequately, add more complexity to it, so in our case it's add more layers. Uh, one thing with neural nets is that you would prefer to add more layers than you would to increase the size per layers. Um, just because of the way they're done hierarchically, like you get much more powerful representations if you make it deeper, rather than making it wider in this case. So instead of going to a thousand hidden units, you'd want to add an extra layer. Um, but those are basically the two parameters you tune to make your model more complex, the number of units per layer and the number of layers. Um, but it's usually a start kind of small. Um, first, well, because that'll take less time when you're testing it. Uh, and then secondly, just add more complexity if it's not fitting. Um, same with any sort of machine learning model, right? You'd want to start simple and if it's not fitting, then add complexity because you don't want to needlessly add that complexity first. <coughs> Um, yeah. Thanks for a very detailed session. It's very uh, I mean, I have a question on the deployment. So, for example, if you build a you know model that be uh, that beats every single simple model that's very easy to deploy, you want to deploy this deep learning model. Um, there's obviously you know challenge around the de deploying this in a in a big system. I wonder whether you have any experience or recommendation on that. And and similarly, if you wanted to. Um, it, it, it turns out to be really difficult, and um, you mentioned about the feature engineering. Can we somehow learn, you know, just leverage some of the results of the deep learning, but still, you know, use that to feature engineer some of the simple models? Um, yeah, so first for deployment, uh, at least for Theano, it's uh, uh, for Theano, it's relatively easy. All you do is um, pickle your compiled run function. Um, actually, in OpenDeep, there's, there's a function for models that lets you compile a run function. Uh, but for Theano, what the, all that's doing is it's taking this F test that we do here, and it's just pickling it. And so you can then deploy this on, say, a GPU server on AWS, and uh, set up a simple Flask server that'll feed in inputs 
and run it through that, well, unpickle the function first, load it in memory, then feed the input through it, and you return out the output as a simple API. Um, and you could do this kind of distributed if you want, because it's just a single function you're pickling. Um, it's fairly easy to deploy it like that. Uh, for kind of, I guess, using a deep learning model to enhance your other simpler, uh, lower size models, uh, I haven't seen any work kind of done with that. Uh, one of the drawbacks for deep learning is you're not actually getting a good view of, of what it's learning representation-wise. The best you can do is kind of those visualizations, um, and they're more used for debugging rather than trying to then handpick other features. But I don't see any reason why you can't kind of look at those outputs of the filters it's learning and try to hand construct features that highlight those filters that it's learning. Um, but most of the time, you know, deployment isn't too much of an issue. I guess it would be on mobile devices. If you have a very large model, you need to condense it down to run on mobile. Um, I know Google's had trouble with that themselves. Like they, they try to constrain the, the parameter size of the model as much as possible. But it's, it's definitely doable, because I mean, they have um, a recurrent that's running on the phone for speech recognition. So. like a simple edge detector would work pretty well uh, for, for features here. Um, but I imagine like using literature from those models like for computer vision like using SIFT uh, is probably a lot better than trying to handcraft you know, an edge detector or something like that. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, so I'm the active one, uh, and there have been other contributors doing bug fixes. Just one, I, I kind of have a little picture of what's not. Thanks, yeah. Uh, Keras is just a little bit more high level um, as far as they try to abstract away all the theorem. So you just uh, use layers directly. Um, there's no real way you can do modifications in between them, stuff like that. I kind of made this as most of, of research code. It's, it's based on a lot of research code that I did for my thesis. Um, so that's kind of where it came from. I need to implement new models from papers. Um, that's kind of that, that point between Theano and kind of Keras is, is where it sits. Yeah. All right, there are no more questions. Let's see. Oh, one more. <laughs> one more. Oh, I guess there are questions. <laughs> Um, do you have any do you have any experience with working with not just voices but also music and maybe separating like what's that what's that thing like removing the background noise from a conversation mm -hmm. Um I haven't personally worked with that, but uh, there is something called a like a denoising autoencoder, which does stuff like that, which is very interesting. So uh, what it would learn is you take your input uh, you add noise, to, so you take clean inputs. Then you add arbitrary background noises to them and try to reconstruct the clean input from the hidden representation of what that noise was. Uh, so denoising on occurs, then you can run it on noisy test input and it should try to denoise it into what it thinks the original input was. Um, so that's, that's the class of models you want to look at, the denoising on encoder. Thanks. Yeah. one more question? All right, let's see Marcus around the clock.